I'm Steve Clemens. I'm a senior fellow here at the New America Foundation. This is like, you know, just old home week for me because I haven't been here for a while. As many of you know, I have another uh, day job as uh, editor at large over at the Atlantic and National Journal. Um, but I do stop by and, and get my mail, and there are so many friends here today, which is, which is terrific. So I know you're not here to see me. You're actually here to hear the content uh, and discussion between two great friends, Richard Vaig, who has just published this week, The Next Economic Disaster, Why It's Coming and How to Avoid It. I like succinct books. I like books, <laughs> you know, I like books that get right to the point and tell you what you need to know and then set up the debate and then put out data and then you can kind of either applaud it or rip it apart pretty quickly and they don't obfuscate behind 900 pages. So I am, before we even get going, grateful for brevity and succinctness uh, and we'll then have to ask Joel Schweninger, who's the director of the Economic Growth Program here, a great colleague, co-founder of the New America Foundation, uh, who's going to analyze uh, and share with us whether it's a brilliant uh, but succinct book or a challenged but succinct book. Uh, I want to recognize Senator Byron Dorgan, uh, a great friend who's here in the second row, uh, who's been a great uh, voice on trade and economic policy for a long time. So I just want to tell you all in advance, he's got to get out at, at six, so I don't care how many hands go up, he gets the first comment or question. Uh, I won't let him filibuster though, so we'll, we'll uh, unless, we'll, we'll have to see. But without further ado, please give Richard Vague uh, a round of applause. Richard Vague, I should say, just to put this in context, Richard is, you know, he identifies himself as philanthropist and kind of an all-round good guy. Um, Richard used to be uh, really in the United States the king of the credit card business. So when Byron Dorgan would be up there and basically saying what's happening with credit cards and too much credit and, 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 and you know part of that bad line of bankers and credit card chiefs, Richard Vague was among them, which is why this project has become so interesting to me. Richard created, for those of you who have airline miles, you know, miles to donate to your universities, miles to buy food at Safeway. The Affinity credit card was of in essentially invented by Richard as the founding uh, CEO of First USA Bank, which later went to Chase. He did the same thing again for Barclays. Uh, but he's an entrepreneur. But I think as he was going through this, and if I could just do a bit of a preamble, Richard, during the buildup to the 2008 financial crisis, he began looking at balance sheets and began looking at private levels of debt, private debt levels in relation to the value of properties that we're using to collateralize those loans. And he just knew that the equation didn't add up. And he'll tell a bit of this story, I think, where he began seeing that the banks were sitting on a house of cards way earlier than others and that there was, a, in a sense, a kind of structural corruption, if you will, of the process, of the regulation, of looking at things that just weren't real. And so Richard had it there, and he's been on a I think an interesting project to begin looking at financial crises and their relations to private debt. We debate government debt. We, we, we like to go out, you know, as, as uh, others have said, and kind of look at, you know, whether the, the, we're spending too much or not within the debt. If you have a financial crisis, you have countries like Spain and others that had very, very little uh, government debt to GDP before their crisis. And where did those crises happen? They happened in the private sector debt market. So I think that is the preamble that I will bring uh, the former king of the American credit card business, who's here to talk about debt, to share with us what he thinks about the relationship between these and how strongly correlated they are to financial crises and anticipating them and what, our, what, what should be the remedy for either protecting ourselves or dealing with them after that. So all, uh, please give a round of applause to Richard Vague. I am really, really grateful to be here today and to have all of you here with me. And a special thanks to Steve, who's done so much to help me uh, as I put this book together, and to Cheryl Swininger, who's done as much or more, and uh, just want to express my real gratitude to you folks. You know, as Steve mentioned, you know, a lot of the debate these days is quantitative easing and government debt and stimulus versus austerity, and I'm I'm going to argue that all those things are secondary considerations to private debt. And to get a little bit more into it, um, in his book Stress Test, Tim Geithner wrote, financial crises cannot be reliably predicted, so they cannot be reliably prevented. And furthermore, in the section on financial reform, which is an extensive legislative accomplishment, he said the goal was to make the system safe for failure. It wasn't to prevent failure. 
My comments today, I'm going to argue that financial crises can be predicted and can be prevented by focusing on private debt. Now first, I think it's important to get a context for this. What I've done on this chart is map from 1997 to 2007 certain categories. This is the decade in, that built up to the financial crisis. And you can see here on the leftmost column, this is the growth in private debt from, two, from 1997 to 2007. That number increased by $14.4 trillion in one decade. The market was flooded with the creation of new money because that's in essence what this is. Federal debt only increased by about three and a half trillion. The money supply only increased a little over four trillion. Uh, or excuse me, the money supply only increased about three trillion. GDP itself only moved up to about 15 trillion. Some of these under, other numbers that we hear about again and again and again are tiny in relation to this number the federal budget, federal taxes, and exports. You could have reduced taxes by 10% for each of those 10 years, and you would have, you would have enabled $10, $2 trillion to be spent in the private economy. That's a tiny number compared to the $14.4 trillion that was released through this massive buildup in private lending. The crisis of 07 and 08 was caused by a rapid increase in private debt. Here's the mortgage loan market from 1970 to 2000. That amount grew by about 17% per year in ratio to GDP. Starting in 01, it took off on a rocket ship. It grew by five trillion. It doubled in about six years. That's a growth rate to GDP of 46%. And it wasn't just mortgages. If you look at private debt in total, and private debt is the sum of business debt and consumer debt, it's about 50-50 or 55-45. And consumer debt, which is around 10 or 12 trillion, 70% of that is mortgage debt. Some of these other categories we think about, like student lending is only a trillion, uh, uh, credit cards are only 600 billion. It's, it's mainly mortgage debt. In total, that number grew in that six, five to six year period by over 20% to GDP. Now businesses and consumers are still highly leveraged. We, we heard a lot about consumer deleveraging. Consumers have not deleveraged very much by historical standards. Uh, Furthermore, we're hearing a lot about how businesses are awash in cash. It's simply not true. If you look at it on a net basis, businesses are net debtors to begin with, and their net debt position is high by historical standards. We're still highly leveraged. Now, if we go beyond the U.S. crisis in 07 and 08, we see that this same rapid five-year buildup in private debt happened in all of our major financial crises. You see it here in the 20s. See this rapid acceleration in private debt that preceded the crash of 1929? Here we see Japan's crisis of 91, 28% growth in five years prior to their crisis of 91. And we'll talk a little bit about what happened after the fact. It was in essence a deleveraging that, that created deflationary pressure, but the buildup of private debt is what brought the crisis. We see this in Asia in 97. There was a 29% growth in private debt to GDP in Korea in the period before the 97 crisis. You also see this in Indonesia here, about a 43% growth in the five-year buildup. Now in every single one of these cases, government debt to GDP is actually benign or improving in the five-year period prior to the crisis. Here you see this dramatically in Spain. Spain, which of the major Eurozone countries, is in the worst shape, and you can see why. There was 49% growth leading up to the crisis. They're now at a level of 216% private debt to GDP, an astonishing number. 
But look what was happening to the government debt prior to the crisis. It was actually improving in ratio to GDP. Businesses feel flush. Consumers feel flush. They're paying more taxes in a lending boom period. The government is receiving more revenue. Everybody feels like they're winning. When we examine this comprehensively for major economies, now I've taken the liberty to carve out the 22 economies that constitute 85% of world GDP and have a half a trillion in GDP each or more. Frankly, three countries, Japan, China, and the United States, constitute 40% of world GDP, so it's a real crisis. And if you look at this, depending on whether you kind of are a lumper or a splitter, there's been 22 crises in these 22 major countries. Pretty much every one of them has seen a buildup of 20% or more in private debt to GDP in the five years prior to the crisis. The converse is true as well. Anytime you see a financial crisis, you see a buildup in private debt prior to that. Now, there's been a lot of focus on mortgage debt. You know, a lot of folks have said, you know, it's mortgage debt in this particular case. And it was in the U.S. 2008 crisis. But if you look across all these crises, it can be other forms of private debt. In Japan in 91, it was more commercial real estate. In South Korea in 97, it was more commercial real estate and industrial loan. It, all that matters is in aggregate private debt is increasing at this 20%. Uh, pace. The form of debt, by the way, also is not that relevant. We saw a lot of securitizations and a lot of credit default swaps in the 07-08 crisis in the United States, and as a result, a lot of people have become quite expert in those particular forms of lending. There have been a lot of crises where there wasn't securitizations and there wasn't credit default swaps. It's, it's been other ways that banks have used to sidestep capital requirements. Another thing that I would note is sometimes in these crises you have delinked lending and risk. You know, there's been a lot of commentary on the fact that in mortgage markets, you know, the, the folks making the decisions about the, the loans that went into the securitizations didn't bear the risk of those loans and those were borne by someone else. Well, that's true. And that's been true in a lot of crises, but there have been a lot of crises where that kind of delinking hasn't been that prevalent. The key is tracking the aggregates and where you have 20% growth in private debt to GDP in five years, you pretty much got yourself an issue. Now, why is it that rapid growth in private lending creates a crisis? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Anytime that lending exceeds the GDP growth rate that much in that short of a period of time, it's evident that we've built too much of something, whether it's houses or office buildings or manufacturers. If you look back in the 1800s, it was railroads. You've built too much of something. And when you've built too much of something, there are two consequences. First of all, you've created a lot of bad loans. In the case of the 0708 crisis, we probably created two and a half trillion dollars worth of problem loans. The banking system only has about a trillion and a half dollars worth of capital. You had a problem. And that's typical for this type of crisis. You're creating more bad loans than there is capital in the system to support that. The second thing that has happened is you've built so much capacity that growth is going to have to slow down until that capacity is absorbed. If you've built a four or five year supply of housing, you can't just wave a magic wand and have that disappear. It's gonna take several years for that excess capacity to, to be absorbed. When you have these two things happen, monetary and fiscal policy are of limited benefit. Pretty much all the discussion has been about monetary and fiscal policy you know, quantitative easing, stimulus, things like this. There's only so much those two things can do. They can soften the blow, they can't solve the problem. Another thing is that triggering events, be it a stock market crash or a bank failure, is often 
ascribed as the reason there was a crisis. It's not true. The, the cow's already out of the barn by the time the stock market crash or the bank failure has occurred. The excess lending has been occurring over years. And all the crashes and all the bank failure is is evidence that it's happened. Another thing to note is that once runaway lending has started, and I'm, touring, I'm terming this, this phenomenon of a five-year uh, rapid increase in lending, runaway lending, that can occur for years. As long as the banks keep lending, the party can continue to, to happen. Now, we've heard a lot of things about other reasons that these crises have occurred. We've heard theories from the black swan theory to it was government debt to it was current account deficits. We looked at all of the criteria on all of these countries. We examined 20 di different factors, including government debt, including declining interest rates, including currency valuations, savings rates, current account deficits. The only one that correlates to crisis is a rapid buildup in private debt. None of these other factors are good predictors. They're either weak or non-existent factors in predicting this. So let's change the, the subject ever so slightly here. We've been talking about crises per se in the slides thus far, but apart from any crisis, the high level of private debt is a problem in and of itself. And I found this slide remarkable when I first came across it. But in 1950, private debt to GDP in the United States was 55%. Today, it's 156%. It's tripled in a little over two generations. Um, and that's not just true in the United States. Here's all the major Western countries graphed, and I've thrown China in here for good measure. But in 1970, all these major economies were more in the range of 50 to 100 percent private debt to GDP. Today, they're kind of in the 125 to 150 to 200 percent range. The whole world is getting highly leveraged. And we've, re we've seen a lot of headlines over the past week or so about Portugal and another lending failure in Portugal. Here's Portugal. Private debt to GDP in Portugal is 255%. The problem there is not government debt. The problem there is not this and that and the other. The problem is accumulated private debt over time. Spain, as I mentioned earlier, kind of the outlier among the major Eurozone countries, at 216%. When you have that much private debt, a very simple thing occurs, and that is money that consumers across the United States would be spending on restaurants and new cars and vacations and other goods and services, they are instead diverting to service a too high level of debt. That, in our mind, is the reason we're experiencing a lackluster recovery. We and Europe both. And frankly, the, the situation's more acute in Europe than it is in the United States. So that brings us to the issue of how do you prevent a crisis and how do you repair a situation where you have too much debt in the aftermath of a crisis? Well, I was in the banking industry for most of my career and I can assure you that where regulators want to intervene, regulators can intervene. The key is monitoring the aggregates. If the, the regulators, the Fed, and all these associated entities are looking at the rate of growth of private debt to GDP, it's fairly easy to see years in advance a problem developing. Regulators can then influence countercyclical credit policies. The Federal Reserve, frankly, could use private debt growth as a factor in setting interest rates. They can intervene with strengthened capital requirements. There's a lot of things they can do when they see this kind of th thing developing. Which leads us to the problem of repair. 
you've had a crisis, you're sitting there with too much debt, how do you get out of a situation like we currently have, frankly, across the world, where we have too much private debt to GDP? Well, you could have folks pay down that debt, but that brings economic contraction in and of itself. Uh, we saw this, frankly, that was the reason for the astonishing contraction in the period 1930 to 33. We could grow, but there's never been a period in modern economic history where you've had GDP growth that was not matched or exceeded by private debt growth. You could inflate your way out of this, but frankly, we've run these models every which way we could think of, and it takes a generation or more to get out of this if you, if you rely on inflation. That only leaves one thing by process of elimination. That's restructuring debt. We have probably on the order of 9 million mortgages that are underwater today out of the 55 million mortgages in the United States a broad scale program to, those, to go to those consum consumers, however politically unpopular it might be, would do, go a long way to boosting the economy because the net effect would be that money is freed up to spend on goods and services. Restructuring would have a salutary effect on GDP growth. It's no mystery to me why our economic recovery tends to be less than we would hope for. Now that brings us to just a couple of more slides that I have before I turn the podium over to Cheryl. And that is the current situation in China. Runaway debt growth in China is at alarming levels. Here you see the history back to 97. What we've suggested is that a growth rate of 20% or more in a five-year period is one that should bring concern. The growth rate in China, and by the way, the numbers are a little fuzzy and you get slightly contradictory numbers from different sources, no, but no matter which ones you rely on, you're looking at growth rates that's in excess of 40 to 50%. Now, where does this show up? I think probably everybody in this room has read a lot about the problems in China associated with overcapacity. There are many cities that they are referring to as ghost cities that are virtually empty cities of gleaming new buildings. We also see a lot of reports about excess capacity in manufacturing. Uh, it's capacity that's being added to keep the Chinese economy growing that is not justified by demand and is, increase, is, in, is uh, resulting in increased levels of overcapacity. So what is our view of what's going to happen in China? Well, we think a crisis is possible in two to three years. Now the mitigants are very important to focus on. China has only about 32% central government debt to GDP. Now that's low by world standards. Ours is about 100%. Japan's is about 200%. So they have lots of additional borrowing capacity. They are also, through the PBOC and other places, holders of vast financial assets. In both cases, the capacity is, we estimate, easily equal to 20 to 30% of GDP. So China does have capacity to deal with this problem. But even if a crisis is avoided, China has significant and increasing levels of overcapacity. Now here's a little paradox for you. You know, the China released its GDP number here like less than a week ago, and it was 7.5%. And everybody was relieved. Oh my goodness, that's great news. They're still growing at 7.5%. We don't need to worry. GDP growth is more a measure of the capacity being added than it is a measure of the capacity that's needed. So at a 7.5% growth number in China's economy is just evidence that the problem is compounding. China needs to pull back on their growth rates just to absorb the excess capacity they already have. 
Uh, we believe China's situation may be very similar to the one that we, see, we have seen in Japan. Japan had this exact situation, rapid run-up in private debt leading to 91, and 23 to 24 years of sideways growth in the period after that. You can see something like that being the case for China once they come to grips with their problem. Our view is what they will do and what they should do is act preemptively. I mean, you know, it's a situation unlike the United States where the government, in effect, owns the banks. So their, their uh, mandate for keeping those banks alive is, is different and, and, frankly, more compelling than it was in the United States. It's hard to see them not acting. But what they need to do is go in and preemptively recapitalize the banks. So th those banks can in turn go and renegotiate with commercial borrowers. China has about $14 trillion in commercial loans. We estimate that easily one to two trillion of that is bad loans. It may be quite a bit higher than that. They have the capacity to preemptively deal with that. But once they do that, they're going to be faced with this decelerating growth scenario and they're going to have the unemployment problems that they've been trying to outrun all along. And that's where they probably have to look at expanded safety net programs to deal with the social ramifications of slower growth. We think in aggregate the cost to the Chinese economy could be 20 to 40 percent of GDP. So with that, I'll turn it over to Cheryl. Thank you very much. I have to have the, you know, the commas. I'm the punctuation point between speakers. So uh, thank you very much, Richard. I just want to underscore how unusual it is to have a, uh, have a person that was responsible for so much building of debt in America talk about there being too much. And I, I just wanted to say that, Byron, had, had you, you, your jaw might have dropped had you heard that testimony in, in the Senate. Uh, I want to thank Charles Schwenninger for offering some commentary. I want to recognize Michael Lind, who's been his partner. Uh, here at the Economic Growth Program. Both of them will work together on aspects of this. But Cheryl, I'm looking forward to you to uh, tearing up the book. Cheryl Schwenninger. Uh, thank you, Steve, and thank you, R Richard. Uh, we've been w working alongside with um, Richard for the past few months and have issued several reports. The title of one, uh, is on the um, on the slide here, America's debt problem, uh, how private debt is holding back growth and hurting the middle class. We also issued an earlier report called The U.S. Economy After the Great Recession, America's Deleveraging and Recovery Experience. And we will issue in, in the fall a, a report on the, uh, on the China's debt problem. We actually might begin, if I can manage here. I don't know if uh, we actually might begin as sort of, um, I'm not going to cover all this, so don't worry about it. Uh, uh, we might actually begin where Richard left off, which is with the China. What, what Richard didn't say about the 7.5 percent economic growth, he, he made the very important point that it's adding additional uh, capacity to produce that. But <coughs> what he didn't say was in order to get that 7.5 percent growth in this past uh, month, China had to expand its credit at the, at the highest rate it's expanded credit for six years, meaning you had an enormous expansion of credit that took place in, in the May, uh, in the May June period, which enabled it to get reach its growth targets. And this is a, the essential problem of China's debt problem, which is a problem for, for most <coughs> uh, uh, economies that are facing debt problems, namely that it takes an increasing amount of credit growth in order to get a certain amount of GDP. Rishar Sharma of, of, of Morgan Stanley has estimated that the, what we call the credit intensity of China's economy has increased nearly full four fourfold uh, since 2008. So in, in a nutshell, this is a problem that in order to get one unit of GDP, they have to actually have four units of credit. 
and you can't go on for for an endless period without running into a major major problem. Now, <coughs> uh, what what's important about Richard's book is that it actually deals with um, <coughs> with two kinds of debt disasters or economic disasters. One is the acute debt disaster that we talked about that Richard spent the first part of his presentation on, which deals with, with these acute crises that emerge from runaway credit. And in working with Richard on this, uh, I think he's come up with probably the, the soundest criteria of any of the studies that I've seen in being able to construct an early warning system. But if you remember when Richard said, we'll change the subject just a little bit, that changed from the acute debt problem to what is a chronic debt problem. And, and you might call it the, the sort of chronic debt disaster that the US and I would argue China and Europe and Japan are living through now, which is that their economies are very highly leveraged, but their growth is extremely dependent upon the expansion of debt. So this is one of the most revealing, Richard had his revealing graph, and Richard has this graph too. He just it was holding back some of his ammunition on this. But what, what is important to look at is that beginning in the late 70s, early 80s, the divergence that began between the creation of debt and the GDP it produced, such that you have this huge gap now. Uh, and so this, this is, <coughs> a, a, we can worry about the rapid accumulation of debt, but we also have to worry about the fact that if debt doesn't produce GDP, it suggests that something much more serious is wrong in the economy. And this is the chronic debt disaster that, that Richard takes up in his book when he talks about the paradox of debt. American households also became dependent on debt. This is, a, this is a chart of the household debt to disposable income. You can see in order to maintain living standards, households had to take on debt to, to, to uh, maintain their living standards. So <coughs> th this is our essential argument about uh, you know, the, the chronic debt problem, is that, that it takes more and more debt to produce GDP. So in, in the 90s, it used to take one, $1.79 of debt, additional credit to produce one dollar of GDP. That jumped into the 2000 to $2.78. Then with some deleveraging, we've, we've moved down to $2.40, but it's increasing again. Now this is less, this is less than China's inefficient economy, but it still is ver very wor worrying over a period of time. <coughs> now, so it suggests that something more fundamental is, is wrong. That our debt problem is not just the fact that we suffered from an acute financial crisis, but that we have a more serious uh, debt problem that signals that something's wrong in the economy. It's a debt-led growth. It's debt, debt, de a debt-dependent economy. Debt-led growth has led and has been associated with big investment booms and busts. So something's wrong with our financial system because we, we constantly repeat the huge misallocation of capital, which as Richard pointed out, adds capacity that has to then be worked off or writ writ written down. So debt-led growth has led to big investment booms and busts. It also has coincided with income inequality and wealth inequality, suggesting again that we have a problem whereby we're having to create de debt in order to sustain demand and living standards. It's also coincided, obviously, with the decline of labor's share of income. In a slide I didn't put in here, it's also coincided with, with growing current account deficits, meaning that in order to be able to provide demand for the rest of the world, we have to create debt to do so. It, ultimately, it's led to what we call a plutonomy, 
a, an economy dependent on very high end consumption. If you can see the consumption share of the top 5% has grown dramatically over the last uh, approximately two decades. Now the question, this is our other report, US economy, is whether anything has changed as a result of, of the crisis. Our answer is generally no, that there we've seen, as Richards pointed out, that real GDP growth has been weighed down by deleveraging. De this is the weakest recovery, although the one after the tech bubble was also very weak. So, <coughs> so <coughs> the argument that nothing really has changed in the debt-dependent model, real wages remain flat, which means that people still must be able to borrow in order to sustain living standards or, or consumptions. Private sector growth has been mainly in low-wage jobs. Medium household income has fallen even with the recovery. Private investment has only rebounded modestly, so we have not been able to, to, to had a, have a new investment-led growth uh, as well. Government, um, very critically, investment has fallen, which has been the weakest part of the recovery. Manufacturing output, uh, employment, in spite of the very encouraging signs uh, remains below or at 2007 levels. This was put out in, in April, so it may have, uh, I think it surpassed it for a little bit. And we've only had a modest improvement in ex exports. So the overall, uh, <coughs> the overall sort of fundamentals have not improved. Meanwhile, we've had essentially a, uh, I think I missed a slide here. Uh, essentially, I missed a slide in putting this together. We've had essentially a wealth-driven recovery, a wealth and debt-driven recovery because overall leverage is very high. So the stock market has done uh, very well, uh, but inequality has increased in the process. Now, now the problem I see, now it's not going to happen in the acute way that Richard says. But, but there, there is a process underway whereby we're getting growth again only because we're adding debt. <laughs> so th this is one of the more worrying charts. One of the new drivers of uh, or ways we're accumulating sort of uh, uh, is that corporate debt is on the rise. But, uh, but there's a big gap between the, uh, don't know how to do the pointer, between the debt is being, being uh, taken out and, and it resulting in investment. Now that wouldn't necessarily be bad if we were China, but we're not China. We don't have excess necessarily productive capacity in, lo in a, lot of, a lot of things. Uh, I, I know uh, Michael Dannenberg and both Richard are don't believe student loans are, as an aggregate are a, a major problem, but nonetheless, it's one of the forms. If you look at the 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 creation, what what credit has uh, been created, the two areas are are most prominently are student loan and auto loans. Yes, the numbers are relatively small; they're not a mortgage style, uh, uh, but they're symptomatic that families are using. Uh, auto and student loans is a way of filling gaps in in their in their income, and the federal government, of course, has had to increase its debt to offset uh, household deleveraging. But a re remember, government is investment. Government debt has increased, but government investment has fallen. <coughs> I, you know, anyone who knows me will know that I've been an active advocate of of a very robust uh, uh, public investment-led uh, recovery and with, and with running large deficits, but this is not what we've been doing. We've been increasing federal government debt, but without the, without the, without the in, in investment. So we're, we're falling back into the old debt-dependent problem. Now, there, there's, there's one bright spot that I left out, which was the, the energy, oil, and gas revolution, which is the one exception to this, this otherwise picture. But essentially, the recovery is to, again, to debt-dependent, total 
total leverage is about the same as it was before the crisis with the reach of, of, of flow of funds. We're working on a report on China's debt problem. I concur with most of everything that Richard uh, said about this and uh, would, would argue that our tentative conclusions are that this is more likely to be a growth event and not a financial markets event, but it will be a growth event of some significant consequence for China and, and the world economy. I think Steve wants to convene us to, to have questions and answers. Great. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Thank you. Richard, if I can invite you up to uh, maybe take, Cheryl, why don't you take this seat, Richard, here, and I'll sit here on the end. And I just want to ask a few questions and then have a conversation with all of you. And I think we still have beer and wine left, right, folks? Yeah, that's good. So uh, beer and wine and debt, it, it all goes together. Um, I, I just want to say, you know, when, when I've known Richard Bake for a long time, and, and so knowing that whenever you work with a friend, you want to say, what are the blind spots that, that your friend might have? And I thought, maybe I've just got an eccentric, successful businessman who's found a little pet project, and it will be really embarrassing if I support him too much. So um, we went out to try to talk, and Richard said, go try to find people who will punch holes in this notion. And one of the interesting things I found uh, Richard and Cheryl when we went, went out to sort of talk to senior economists, senior policymakers about this private sector debt issue and looking at data sets over time, most of them were rather nonplussed. They said, well, that sounds logical. It sounds very compelling if you've got too much private, but that, that's not new. But when you actually go out into the field and profession, you run into Tim Geithner quotes, and the data sets didn't exist. So that the large scale data sets on private sector debt across a great number of countries didn't, didn't, just weren't there. So Richard hired people to come in and put those debt sets together. They're, they're available at your website, which you might want to share with folks. But I just want to talk about the sociological dimension of this, of why both of you think there has been such a blind spot to thinking about this as one of the drivers of financial instability out in the field of economics, because it's weird that, that, that people, when they heard about it, weren't, weren't surprised, but at the same time, there's very little work done, done in this arena. Richard? You know, it's, I think the debate has, and the analysis has been dominated by the Fed and its economists. And I think the Fed looks at the world through the Fed's own balance sheet. And that causes them to think about the world in terms of deposits rather than in terms of loans. It's the exact opposite of the way a bank's a non-Fed bank's balance sheet works. Uh, so it's very interesting. You, you look at Milton Friedman's monetary history of the United States, 1864 to 1963, or whatever it is, the landmark book. It's a, it's, you talk about seven, 800 page book for it. It's one of those. Yeah. The term private debts doesn't occur anywhere in there. You know, the academic institutions that have come out of the Fed think about this in terms of the Fed structure itself. Cheryl, what do you think? Well, I, I think there's two aspects. One is the political, of course, where we've been subject to a huge campaign about the problems of American government debt. And we need to talk about that because we all know what that's been about. But to particular to your question of why economists have failed is because economists, unlike Richard, don't actually deal with balance sheets. And so they don't understand uh, also that there's multi-sectoral, and this is a problem also for people pushing the government debt problem. They don't realize that, that if one sector is doing something, another sector has to be doing, that there's not just, there's two sides to a balance sheet, but that, that actually we have four different balance sheets. We have a government sector, we have a corporate sector, we have a household sector, and we have an ex external sector. And so people that tend to have a balance sheet view understanding of a world economy that when Gottlieb uh, put forward, Martin Wolf came to, to, to embrace, Michael Pettis on China, you can understand the, the critical role that private debt plays in relationship to the public debt, rather than just single-mindedly focusing on public debt. Yeah, th what I've come to learn through this process is that classic orthodox economics does not include a role for private debt and 
the way they well, put forward yeah, growth I theory. I thought a lot about that. I, and, and you know, when I knew Byron Dorgan was going to be here, I was sort of, you know, wondering, you know, to a certain extent, from the public policy person, a steward in the pol public policy area, when you think about the equation, you've got the, you know, you guys in the banking sector basically kind of belly up. Um, and I'm sort of asking, how did that happen? It happens because most people think that invisible hand economics punishes bad behavior and rewards good behavior. Smart investors and smart stewards of, of the bit. So that's in the private sector. And it's one of my gut feelings is, as to why we haven't thought about this, because you've got a clearing house in the private market that largely takes care of it, unless you have a very big event that then draws in public interest questions of what do you do to step in and save General Motors? What do you do to come in and stabilize it? Thus, tax dollars then get into the mix. And that drives a lot of people then to, to, to politicize that because all of a sudden they're now in the game. But they weren't in the game before. And what you're saying is, as, as we build up, there are a lot of these behaviors that are replicable. I remember in the build up on when Dean Baker and everybody was out there and saying there's a bubble building, you'd go to the World Economic uh, Outlook meetings, or the IMF Spring Bank meetings, and they would say, well, in 35% of cases like this, it's a bubble. But that's about all they would say. And, and, and furthermore, they wouldn't. But it's interesting. The other el I element say, I gotta yeah. do yeah. one other thing. Yeah. We sent this manuscript in an early version out to eight economists to comment on and got lots and lots of helpful comments. But the best was one from a very orthodox economist that is just trashed the manuscript and said, there is no basis for Vague's wild assertion that debt has anything to do with growth. <laughs> Um, <laughs> quoting, <laughs> and, and here I've spent my whole career thinking: if you're going to grow, you build a factory, and you borrow to build a factory, yeah. and you know, debt yeah. is in fact integral to growth. It's interesting. The other question I have is a, a, a very thick book, in contrast to this one, uh, is basically the history of debt by David Graeber, and in there he talks about in ancient times about there being a jubilee, the forgiveness of debt, and so one of the other shockers as I got to sort of watch your evolution is that whether you call it restructuring of debt, it really is a forgiveness of debt. And Richard went to a number of the Federal Reserve uh, banks and met with economists attached to them. And they would always go, if you do that, you open up a moral hazard problem. And I'm interested, because I want to make this political too. We had a major financial crisis with structural corruption, a key piece of it. And you bailed out uh, elements of that equation, but didn't bail out many of the loan holders in the middle class, because that would create you know, mo you know a, a moral hazard risk for the future. Why didn't it create a moral hazard risk for the future with the other parts of the equation that got bailed out? And, and, and shouldn't, and like in the Jubilee case, isn't this a sort of case that calls for an exceptional response? Because that debt that just lags out there as it is now has to be a ball and chain around yes. growth, right? It has to be, a, but, so if you were to bring it down and structure it to real values, you could kick back into growth probably more quickly. So tell me where I'm wrong. Richard, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, you know, the moral hazard question is one that's there and it's real and it's on everybody's mind. I mean, I go talk to the bartender down the street about this theory and say, well, you know, and one of the things we need to strongly consider, and by the way, we need to strongly consider it way more in a place like Spain or Portugal where the need is acute than we do in the United States. It, but it, let's just start with the United States. But, you know, you know, and and the minute I mention the idea of restructuring an individual's mortgage, the reaction is immediate and visceral. That's not fair. Hmm. And that's right. It isn't fair. Nor was saving the banks fair. This, you know, if you're talking about a country where private debt to GDP has grown from 55% to 150% fixed percent in two generations, and you want to fix that problem, you're going to have to deal with moral hazard issues. It's the least bad in choice. In ancient Jewish communities, they did it with this jubilee. Where they did one kind of debt erasal, and then you start it over again. So well, why not consider well, th something th like this that? This is the crisis of capitalism now, or the crisis of the world economy. Because if you look at it, every major geoeconomic region economy is now highly leveraged, probably more so than it can. And it will be, according to, to Richard's analysis, a drag a drag on, on growth. And so while I, I, would, uh, I would favor Richard's uh, debt restructuring and, and debt forgiveness at the, at the micro private level to the extent that we can make the political case and the fairness case, uh, 
But we are also going to have to, to deal with this at the global macro level. And the, the case, therefore, the, the global macro mechanism of getting rid of a lot of this debt is actually to extinguish it at the federal level uh, with, through the US, uh, using the US uh, principal reserve currency and its exorbitant privilege to do so. Unfortunately, the politics to do that is blocked. But if we are not able to, in a sense, extinguish a lot of this debt over the next five to 10 years, the world economy is going to be dragged down and, and, and in a very difficult uh, uh, position. If you look, look at those leverage levels across, the, across Europe, across the United States, across China, across Japan, across Korea, wherever you look. Anybody seeing if the markets are falling right now based on Cheryl's <laughs> comments? We'll have to run out and see. Let me open the, the floor to comments and questions. Paula Stern, we have a microphone for folks? Sydney is going to run the microphone. Paula Stern. Thank you very much, and thank you very much um, for sharing your thesis. Um, we, I had the privilege of hearing uh, the presentation as you were working on it and came away completely concerned about China as the most imminent um, uh, source of the next crisis and therefore thinking that we were going to spend today talking about China and what it ought to do. But this discussion just suggests that it's really, if U.S. doesn't resolve in, in a manner it, the private debt in which you describe it, that that is the greatest threat to global economic future. Um, I'm kind of surprised by that and I'm wondering why it appears that you're more relaxed about the China situation um, because they both are such enormous economies and can have of course enormous uh, 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 vicious uh, impact on the world economy however we resolve this private debt issue so I I'm wondering if I you can which is I, mean, so I didn't get the sense you were more. relaxed about China <laughs> well I should have been more tense when I was talking about China. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, and in fact, we're doing some work now for, you know, for a follow-up. I don't know if it'll be a follow-up article or follow-up book. We're trying to go deeply in to the China situation right now and, and see exactly what the linkages, linkages are to the rest of the world, both trade and debt linkages, so we can, you know, can pre-map what we think the contagion might be for an issue in China. Uh, but if you think about the history of you know, the last several decades, um, Japan was under leveraged and they got over leveraged in 91. Mm -hmm. The US and Europe had low leverage and we've gotten over leveraged in 07 and 08. The only place left that was driving growth in any material global way was China. Now they're over leveraged. Yeah. Everywhere you look in the world where you have major economies, we have too much debt and too much capacity the worst scenario for growth as we think about it over the next generation. I mean, if I may, one of the interesting things uh, about the U.S. side is while, while aggregate levels of private sector debt remain very, very high, there, there's, there's this sort of myth or belief that there's been significant deleveraging. There's been modest deleveraging, but not significant deleveraging. So the, the, the aggregate remains there. And what I worry about is not necessarily another crisis or a bubble bursting as much as how do you, how do you get I worry about the middle class. And when you begin looking at those charts in the 1950s and 60s, and you see that that rise of leveraging was associated to building out capacity, and the middle class had its best heyday uh, in this country. And today you've got lots of capacity, very high levels of debt, and eroding middle class. And so if you put it into those equations, that is what I worry about. That's a different kind of, of structural um, crisis in my view. Paula, I want to go Paula, to, to Senator Gordon. Let me, let me but, add a yeah. point quickly. But Paula, you're quite right to worry about China from a growth point of view and, and its implications. And one of the reasons why you're, if, if you remember my chart where ch China's credit intensity has increased to four to one, that understates it because see China free rides off of world demand. So China, <coughs> 
China's growth is actually even more dependent on than debt dependent than, than just its own creation of debt because it relies on the US and Europe to create debt to buy Chinese goods and, and services and products. Therefore, China is actually more debt dependent economy than, than the US or Europe is. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it, it's potentially gonna suffer a much deeper, deeper and protracted <coughs> a blow to its economic growth as a result of this double, double reliance on debt. Senator, did you have a question, comment? The um, invisible hand you referred to a moment ago, Adam Smith's invisible hand, never contemplated uh, enterprises too big to fail and also mm -hmm. apparently too big to prosecute. Right. And that's tweetable. I was, <laughs> I, I was uh, thinking about, uh, I was smiling because I was, I was on two airplanes last week and on both of them, flight attendants uh, went up and down the aisle passing out applications for credit cards. That's the business the he started. That's right. <laughs> That but program you know, I, was my program. But in, <laughs> in Congress for 30 years, we had a lot of economists and businessmen and women come in front uh, of us. Uh, and, you know, th this is an interesting idea that and I don't know whether you're right or wrong, but it's very interesting and I think merits a significant discussion. Um, I'm also mindful of the analyst on Wall Street who apparently predicted 10 of the last two recessions. So, you know, uh, it, it's, it, it's easy to spell disaster ahead, but uh, I think this is a useful discussion to have. And I, I, I wanted to ask this question. Had you had, you had a chart, 1950 to 2014, uh, overlaid with uh, profits of the financial service industry and growth of that industry, and a tendency to, number one, wallpaper every college kid's room with credit card applications, kids that didn't have a job and didn't have any money, or uh, went to Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan and said, can you ease up just a bit on leverage buyouts, on mergers, on financing uh, hostile takeovers? Uh, wouldn't that be antithetical to everything that exists in the financial service industry today? And, um, and I happen to know how much muscle that industry has in this town. I wrote a book about it. Uh, so how does one Great deal point. with that? Well, you're exactly right. A boom is a company, you know, the correlation between increase in financial institutions and, and uh, a boom is, is pretty dramatic. And financial institution profits from 1950 to the present have gone from low single digits, 3 or 4 percent of GDP, to 11, 12, 13 percent of GDP. So you can see that what you say is exactly true. And I, the, the prescription that I put forward in my book is the, the way to deal with this is significantly stepped up capital requirements for lenders and not just banks but but all lenders and I'm not talking about the kind of adjustment R recently we had the Dodd-Frank capital requirement increase which I think is less than a hundred billion dollars in additional capital at the banks remember the problem was two and a half trillion dollars an additional hundred billion in capital isn't going to do much you know, we're, we're talking about a material rethinking of the capital requirements of these institutions. Instead of being like roughly 10 to 12 percent as they are now, you're talking about 15 or 20 percent. It's never going to happen. But it is the correct thing for moderating uh, growth away from financing dependent types of growth to more innovation dependent forms of growth. Interesting. Uh, Bill Goodfellow. Thank you. Let me speak to the other side of, of this. Uh, we Americans love credit. It's like a cultural thing. We're addicted. In 1950, I don't think credit cards existed. You bought a car for cash. Our parents wanted a house. They saved money until they had enough money to build it. Now, you know, we love credit. We live on credit. You, you, nobody buys cash. Go to a restaurant, nobody pays cash except maybe at McDonald's. And so it's a cultural thing. And there's, there's almost like a disconnect between uh, what you want and actually paying for it because it doesn't happen for a couple of months down the line. And credit card debt is about 21%, I think, so it's not very sensitive to interest. So you're really talking about a cultural change um, on the part of Americans. And you want a Buick with leather seats? It just adds a few dollars more to your payment. So there's a, there's a real cultural problem. It's we, you well, know, how do you get around that? I, I got it. 
you're one of my very favorite people in the world, and the work you do in your think tank is superb work, and I've benefited from your work. So I must, with great trepidation and with great respect, disagree. I don't think any of this is a moral problem or a moral failing. We, did, we reconstructed debt going back to 1800. We've, we've reconstructed the debt profile of the United States going as far back as we could piece together records. Debt has always been a mechanism, as Steve implies by his earlier comments. Debt was a big part of what was going on in Babylon and Egypt and France before the... I mean, de debt and the, and the use of debt is not new. And I don't think we can change human behavior. I think the solution is more the amount of capital we require our lenders to set aside for emergency. And if you made a big difference in that, that is a sufficient modulant. So capital adequacy ratios. Capital, meaningful rethinking of capital adequacy ratios. That would include every kind of debt you can think of, if it's structured prop. I, I think, Bill, one of the things that, that I, I think that, that before this, so if you're back in the 1980s or 1985, before you'd have that divergence from credit provision to whatever, you know, believe me, my parents were addicted to debt, and, and, and you had lots of folks out there. So that, that characteristic was as true then. The question is what structurally changed to create so much more, and that's what Byron Dorgan yeah. was getting at. I, I, I think Banks learn how to sidestep capital requirements. I know because I was a banker, and I learned how to sidestep capital requirements. I, I think it's also important, however, to stress the other part of Richard's thesis, is that we need mechanisms. We need the jubilees. We need the mechanisms for restructuring the debt. Because <laughs> I was never a believer in limits to growth in terms of population and resource. I am a believer of limits to growth when it comes to debt. You, you get at certain levels of debt uh, which begins to weigh on economic growth and you have to find ways through bankruptcy, through restructuring and other mechanisms to replenish the capitalist system and the credit system. And we're at that historical point where we're going to reach limits to growth because of the, because of the debt overhang and private debt. Uh, the financial institutions will continue to be very creative to find ways to, to, to provide credit to, to Americans. But if you look at the balance sheets of most American households, they're not in a position to be able to take on much more debt. In many, many I mean, one of the, the crimes, I think, <coughs> I mean, not a crime, let me be careful here. One of my great um, uh, disappointments in the Obama administration and the United States Senate, I had no expectations of the House, but when the financial crisis occurred, um, it was an extraordinary crisis because it didn't only affect the social contract in the United States, it affected America's position in the world because it removed the ability uh, that the U.S. had really on how to guide and counsel and nudge other economies to organize it. It was a hugely consequential crisis, more consequential than the other crises because it, it basically knocked us off our pedestal to a certain degree. And the implications of that were that, that when you did bail, I remember within one year, and I think Byron gave a speech about this once, where within one year, uh, people had bailed out firms that were 5,000 people with million dollar plus bonuses. So 5,000 individuals had bailed out firms. And when you go and look at whatever, and I said, well, if you're gonna have that element of bailout, why not look at the fact that if you're going to write down mortgage or force a restructuring process, right, not a full forgiveness, but force a restructuring process to mark down the values but keep people in their homes, that would then kind of keep, keep the system going. And, and you could deal with the moral hazard problem by basically saying, you know, you had a massive systemic hit on the whole economy and people that were losing their jobs and the kind of rollback was not their fault. It was the fault of these, you know, the bubble bursting and these other folks that were colluding. So I think the White House and other leaders in the country failed to make that case at the time about the extraordinary moment that was. So I don't know if you have any reaction to that, Byron, but then, I mean, would, I think you agree with me, don't you? Yeah, that's why he quit. But it's not too late. Yeah. I mean, that well, really I don't know. I think it is too late, but. From a political feasibility standpoint, it feels to me like it's. But you had an idea to get the government regulators 
to say that rather than taking write-offs and restructuring loans in full, you could give them 20 years, 30 years, whatever, so that they could take that off so it didn't hit their balance sheet. Their problem is their balance sheet. And so financial institutions worried about the impact of rewriting these things, that if the regulators change that aspect, you could create an incentive structure that might move you along this Yeah, way. this happened in the Latin American di uh, debt crisis in the early 80s in a smaller, less well-known way that Volcker brought every, all the banks in a room and said, we're going to let you write this debt over 10 years, mm -hmm. go and send no more. And we think in, in this case, you know, if you, if you take this, these underwater portion of these mortgages and make the banks write that down, it threatens the capital levels of the bank, so that's not realistic. If you ask the government to socialize it by reimbursing the banks, that's not going to fly. What, we, what I propose in the book, based on these things that have happened in the past, is just let the banks amortize that loss over 30 years if they restructure with the borrower. That creates very little current consequence and I think is feasible for, th for folks to consider. Yes. Um, Cuneo and then, and then Pat Malloy. Yes. <coughs> My name is, <coughs> sorry. Cuneo Ma Kikuchi. Kunio Kikuchi, and I've been here now since 1966, but uh, I go to Japan uh, two to three times a year. And the uh, first notion, of course, is that I think uh, everybody has a fetish, as I would call it, for growth. And I think growth is for countries that are not wealthy, uh, not for countries like Japan and US and Europe, they don't need to grow because countries like China and India has to catch up with the US and Japan and uh, Europe. Uh, as you know, uh, China is only about a third as wealthy as Japan today, and they have 20 more years to go. Uh, and you know, Steve, how Japan's last 20 years of stagnation, the country has transformed itself. And so what's wrong with it? They've I'd aged like in place well. That. Yes. <laughs> and, and that's a model for yeah. the rest of the world, for so the rich aging countries. in place well, Thank should you. we just stop growing, Richard? You know, I think you, you touch on a deeply philosophical issue in that, you know, economies didn't grow for thousands of years. And in the uh, Industrial Revolution happened, and economies have grown, you know, very rapidly since that. And then if we hit this debt ceiling, uh, we're looking at more sideways growth. So I, I, I can't speak to the philosophical issue, but I, I'll give you an anecdote. I had a professional woman who I happen to know that works at the University of Pennsylvania, got an advanced copy of the book. She's not an economist. She came to me and she said, you are exactly right. My family has been struggling for the past six or seven years. We pay our mortgage every month. We haven't bought a new car. We can't send our kids to the kind of schools we want. We, can't, we don't take vacations, and we haven't for seven years. And we're working like hell. And we're working as harder than we ever have. So that aspect of it, I think, needs to be addressed, irrespective of your more fundamental view of growth. Pat Malloy? And then we'll go to you. Two quick questions, and then I need a drink. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and right here. Yes. Thank you for this uh, putting on a wonderful program. Short question, Pat. Thirty seconds. Okay, quickly. I've been reading some uh, articles by Ralph Gomery and Dick Silla, yeah. where they talk about the movement of the United States from stakeholder capitalism, which was going on from 1950 to about 1980, and then the movement to stakeholder capitalism where everything is focused now not on workers or share, Wait, but on shareholder, or share, shareholder, on shareholder yeah. and, and, and shareholder profits. Right. And that that's when you really had this grave discrepancy between, prof, be, between the value added by the corporation and the worker's share. And then the need to borrow to maintain a lifestyle by the workers for what they're no longer earning. And then further incentives by the shareholders and the CEOs who tied their own compensation to shareholder value to outsource jobs to further increase their own profits. Then I look at the Cheryl's point about the, the corporations are now borrowing 
to buy back their own stock. Well, it seems to me that would give the CEOs higher compensation and the existing shareholders higher compensation. So that, that, that somehow this is all, t it can be tied to this movement in America from stakeholder capitalism to shareholder capitalism. And what can we do about that kind well, of problem? Well, you know, I, I, I'm, I can only timidly offer comments because those two folks are, are brilliant and their theory is brilliant. But I've studied uh, business history going back a couple of years, 100 years in the United States, and I don't think there's anything particularly new about the way management of businesses operate versus the way they operated in the late 1800s. The thing that is different is the amount of debt uh, that, that the middle class and small businesses are carrying. You know, uh, if you think about the immediate post-World War II period, we didn't have enough capacity in the United States and we had very low levels of debt. That's a perfect formula for the rapid rise of the middle class because we got to build capacity and we have a lot of room to finance it through debt. That to me is the history of the 50s and 60s mm -hmm. in this country. Today we have in essence the opposite scenario. We have more capacity than we need still six years later, especially in housing, and we have historically high levels of debt. That's the worst scenario for the expansion of the middle class. Right here in the middle. Hi. Uh, I believe your comment right here addressed the crux of the issue. In the 1950s, someone who worked for GM without an advanced degree could sustain a very high level of middle class uh, lifestyle, pay their kids for higher education. Now, let's say Apple is the leading company of the U.S. They employ maybe 40,000, 60,000 here versus 500,000 GM did. And the rest are in China. About 700,000 people work for Foxconn. And very soon, Foxconn is going to come up with robots that are going to even replace the Chinese workers. So, so if you look at the problem with debt, it is maybe a stemming of the problem that the income isn't there. And that could have been a, by fa a factor of two uh, variables, globalization temporarily for a while, and ultimately technology. Yes, I, I think your points are, are very well taken and harking back to, to um, your earlier uh, point as well, that a number of factors have come together beginning in the late 70s and 80s that have created a paradigm shift. One is the technology globalization. One is share the movement from stakeholder to shareholder. Another is fi financial in innovation. And they've created a, a system whereby you have these correlations between the need to have an increase in private debt to offset uh, offset for at least macro purposes the demand that is lacking from from stagnant wages and falling household income. And I think this is becoming widely appreciated and accepted. The question is whether there is a policy program and a political program that can, that can offer a compelling alternative to, to that. And that's, that's really, really the challenge. Right, uh, right here in the middle. Uh, this gentleman will take these two here and then we'll go for drinks. Yes. Yeah, Joe Marie Griesgraber. I wanted to ask you um, how you would address the distribution issues in the United States. You say there is inadequate demand. Now, you touched on the wages. But what we're seeing is that the resources go to the financial sector rather than to wages. And I guess that's a political question I'm asking. How do we rebalance? Uh, rest, yeah, rebalance and rest control from the private sector who buys our presidential candidates. And then we get a choice between two bad options are too so what, very what, limited. So what is your response to Piketty? What's your better idea than Piketty? How's that, that as a, a question? Richard? You know, you know again, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm currently reading extensively in the history of the United States in the late 1800s, and I don't, I don't feel anything that's going on today is unfamiliar territory for our country. 
And this is kind of the way humans behave and so forth. The difference. Did you get the greatest disparities of wealth in the, in the late 1800s? Well, there was a couple. But you know, remember, the, in, the, in the 1800s, we had a crisis in 1819, 1837, 1853, 1873, 1893, 1906, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it happens. As soon as the lenders forget what making bad loans does, you get another crisis. I, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but debt, the increases in debt is a form of demand. And if you're coming from a low level of debt as we were in the 50s and 60s, that was extremely healthy and fueled the expansion of the middle class and kind of made this equation work, in my view. And we've got the opposite today. Hmm. Cheryl? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I, I think the only way we begin to work our way out of this is, is by massive public investment at this particular historical juncture. It's the only way to square, try to square the circle. Uh, part of the problem and now- you feel in your bones that we're on the, on the edge of massive public investment? No, no, no we're not. <laughs> we're, we're actually working ourselves into a new problem. And so that, that the, the kind of um, balance sheet recession is going to give way to a new form of stagflation, because in mm -hmm. in some even though we have this overcapacity globally and still have some overcapacity domestically and we have inadequate demand, we're also robbing ourselves of the supply side future, because of both sustained periods. What happens after balance sheet recessions and financial crises is that you have long sustained periods of underinvestment and pri private investment for a number of reasons, not only because the financial system is risk averse, but because you don't obviously have adequate demand, so it doesn't drive, drive in, in investment. Uh, but, but you also have uh, this sort of uncertainty and caution about, about the future. That that does provide some correction if you're solely in a, in a domestic economy. But if you're in a global economy where other countries aren't adjusting, where they're continuing to add capacity, then you can find your lack of private investment and public investment leads to deteriorating uh, productivity mm -hmm. capacity and productivity growth in the future. So we're in the process of, of a transition from creating this from moving from a balance sheet recession and subpar growth that is driven by inadequate demand to one that is also limited by, by our supply capacity because partly we're also misallocating enormous amount of investment now mm. that's going to social media companies and, and, and certain kinds of uh, bubbles on, uh, mini bubbles on, on the stock exchange that aren't adding any real future growth to the American economy. The Atlantic Media Company is nonetheless happy with that trend. <laughs> um, uh, let me take this gentleman here for the last comment. And then we'll have drinks, everybody. You can bring your, your question. Yes, go ahead. It's, uh, John Graham. And I, John Graham. I, I'd, I'd sort of like to reflect off this gentleman's question. And yeah. uh, to take the counterpoint, nobody put a gun to your head and ordered you to borrow money, right? So uh, I appreciate that the government bails out Goldman Sachs and not the middle class. but. What about the role as a perpetrator of this? You know, the, the student loan market is socialized, the mortgage market is socialized, the Fed owns all, you know, is gorging on Fetty Franny debt. So, I mean, I, I appreciate, you know, re revisiting capital standards, but what about the government as the perpetrator and in inducing people's worst instincts to over leverage their households? Good question. The government. Can I just ask you to clarify? So you're saying the government is subsidizing co the loan expansion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we we get the question. You know, a lot of folks, you know, are, you know, are, are inclined to blame the government for being a catalyst. Is that fair way to say it uh, to this? And you know, again, looking at the 22 situations where we have data, there's a lot of times that the government is a catalyst for this thing. But there are occasions where the government not a catalyst. I don't think bankers necessarily or lenders necessarily need someone to incent them to want to lend more and more. 
you know, that's just the na that's how you win in, in that game. So, you know, I think it, I think it true either way. And the other thing I would note is it's really hard when you really get inside it, whether it's in the late 1800s or the 1920s or 2014, to really completely separate government and business. They're very entangled no matter where and when you look in history. The, the examples you provide uh, raise another issue, which is there's two competing important goals. One is to democratize access to credit and capital and how best to do that. And the other is, is how to properly regulate finance and avo avoid moral hazards and, and over lending and over, over borrowing. And I do think it's a problem when we, uh, uh, Michael Lynn at, at, in our Economic Growth and Next Social Contract uh, has done a lot of work and also we published a, an important paper which called Kledocracy. Whenever you subsidize the private sector to do a public good, you develop problems of, of un, unintended consequences, so to speak. And so, so pr you know, s trying to subsidize private institutions to lend to students, I think, is a mistake. Yeah. Providing grants and direct loans at very low cost is not so. If you want to subsidize housing, let's do it in a way that doesn't s subsidize the, 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 the lenders. Therefore, you can democratize credit and at the same time maintain the sort of fiscal fiscal and regulatory discipline that is necessary. I think it's a really interesting debate. It's an interesting point because I do think that one of the unusual questions that you clearly had before the subprime crisis, uh, uh, people that were, were over their heads before the, the crisis, I mean, it was, just, it was just sort of structurally clear. You also had a lot of Americans who were living the kind of lives that would have been predicted to be normal, stable, who were hit by the tsunami of the events, massive job contraction, and you ended up with a substantial echo effect out there that they began doing that. And I sort of think that's where the policy response in part failed. But I'm so pleased that we had this discussion because as we've been chugging along for a couple of years on this, looking, I've been you know, a a interested in the, in the uh, economics profession and people that had just not paid much attention to these private sector debt behaviors. And then looking both at this, this equation of the overall aggregate level of debt, which just to remind is about a, over 150% of GDP is a screaming red light combined with the rate of growth of that GDP. So you can be up there for a long time if you're not growing and maybe you can kind of inch your way out of it. But these two things correlate with an awful lot of mankind's experiences with, with these debt crises. And so it's interesting. The data is again where um, that people the, can the, go. The, the, our, my little book. Yeah. My little book yeah. that Steve oh. mocked yeah. is out there, and my mother would be so happy if you'd buy it. I did not page. mock your book. Th that, and, uh, and uh, that, <laughs> that book is the same size as John Kenneth Galbraith's fantastic book on financial bubbles. It feels so much yeah. better now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a website, debt-economics.org, that has all it's this a great, data. great place with all the data so that folks can go kick, kick it around. So I want to thank Richard Vague and Cheryl Schweninger for spending time with us. Thank you so much.